watching Over the Edge from Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. And we're back, and I'm joined with, by Dr. Karen Meech. Do you lose sleep at night um, over the possibility that one, we could be hit at any time by something that caused great damage or even a mass extinction? Um, do you... No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I imagine the chances aren't very high since we haven't been hit in a while, but eventually, long enough time, something's going to... Um, do you think we need to be very proactive in that as as in mapping near earth objects and looking at mitigation strategies? Yes, I th I think that's the sensible thing to do because if there's something that could wipe out civilization however improbable that is and we have the capability to deal with it at effectively very low cost, I think it's inexcusable not to do it. But I don't lose sleep over it because I think it's a low probability event. But we do have things like Chelyabinsk, where people were injured across, you know, central Russia when this 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 thing came through, mainly from the the uh, explosion the detonations of the thing. But it shattered windows and injured people. And this this is something that happens, you know. And this happens mostly over water, but it's you know something like that happens fairly often. Um, but do we have a prayer to spot something that small ahead of time? Uh, well, Chelyabinsk was about 20 meters in size and the current surveys that are funded are not intending to get down to that level so probably not for the foreseeable future um, right now nasa and other places are spending resources to get the big things that could be you know citywide devastating or regionally devastating or civilization devastating but we think we've covered those of course, an interstellar object we'd have no way to predict. Um, I think we're not at the stage where we'll be getting the 20 meter class for a while. So we're in danger for decades, essentially, to uh, something that could devastate a city. I wouldn't say, I wouldn't go that far. Chelyabinsk certainly wasn't something that would devastate a city. Um, no, I think perhaps for tens of years we're still looking for the 100 meter to 300 meter class things but i think we're in good shape and i don't lose sleep over it i think you're more likely to die driving home from work today than you are from a meteor strike true true um but they have actually <laughs> small ones have actually hit cars and you know things like that in the past uh gone through houses um as i recall back in the 1950s somebody was hit they were in in their bed and a meteorite came through the uh the roof and hit them <laughs> they survived it but you know what are the odds of getting hit by a meteorite though um now what is the future for Oumuamua? um can any more study be done on this object well i'm constantly amazed at the fact that papers keep coming out although they're now s starting to recycle some of the ideas um there's not much more, I think, that can be done with the data in hand. Uh, certainly, there could be theoretical speculation, but I think it's been exciting to see the energy and the creativity that have been put into the science around Oumuamua. And in fact, I think the more exciting thing will be when we discover the second one. And I know everyone is is anxiously waiting for that and planning their observing strategies and uh, getting pre-written telescope proposal so they can leap right in and get telescope time. As I recall, there's a couple of comets um, that may also have interstellar origins originally that may have been captured by Jupiter. Uh, do you know anything about those? Well, the only comets I, you know, there's a handful of comets that have eccentricities of the orbit that are greater than one, which would suggest interstellar. But in all cases that I've known of, these guys, um, have had close approaches to the giant planets which has affected their orbit. Comet Bowl, for example, I think it was 1980, had an eccentricity of 1.05, which was the largest prior to Oumuamua. And it, when they traced its orbit backward, it had had an encounter with the giant planets. So as far as anything that's confirmed interstellar, um, no, I don't know of any. But chances are we're going to find a lots more in the not too distant future as as things like lsst come online um but i i suppose the best question to ask would be 
what do we hope to learn? You know, what what is it that that finding an interstellar object and actually being able to intercept and study it beforehand? You know, Momo is basically long gone by the time we could have done anything with it unless we went through some crazy um, rocket launch or something like that that could maybe intercept it. But chances are we can't. Um, but now, now that we'll be able to look for these objects, what what do you expect to be able to study from interstellar objects? Well, before I answer that, your your comment on chances are we can't rendezvous isn't really correct. I mean, with Oumuamua itself, while technically possible, it would have been extremely expensive and, and difficult. But for the next one, if the surveys give us enough warning, um, I just participated in a, a Keck Institute workshop study of what are some of the innovative ideas and technologies that would allow us to explore these once in a lifetime objects, either interstellar objects or a brand new long period comet or one of these so-called Manx comets that may be debris from the inner solar system coming back in. And I think the prospects are pretty good. Um, even within the current um, NASA mission portfolio, you could design missions with small satellites, CubeSats, and other small satellites that could reach one of these objects. Because I think some of the really fundamental science that you'd like to get would require a more up close and personal investigation since you don't have that much time from ground-based facilities. And I think things like isotopes, really getting a good handle on the chemistry would be phenomenal in, in terms of placing the fragment of another planetary system into the context of what was going on in that solar system. So say it's an object that formed, you know, in a completely different area of the galaxy, say closer to the central bulge of the galaxy, you would expect to see different isotopes and different um, composition? Yeah, I would think so. And of course, probably <laughs> exposure to radiation. Um, or if But it you know, if if it formed much closer to the center part of the galaxy, we wouldn't know it because the longer it travels through space, every stellar encounter changes its trajectory. And so you lose any information about its origins. What was special about Oumuamua was its incoming velocity was so similar to the local neighborhood that everyone suspected that it has been recently ejected from something relatively nearby and that this was its first pass to a star. Oh, so it, it, you can infer that, that it, it, it appears to be, a, I mean, recent in geologic time periods. How? Well, recent, you know, many, maybe a few millions of years. Really? Because with everything moving around in space, you know, the stars are moving within the galactic potential that every encounter that a little tiny piece of debris would have alters its trajectory forever. And so once it's had an alteration, there's no way to trace backwards the full complete path of every star it's interacted with. But what it will do is it will change its velocity so it will no longer look like the local neighborhood. And it looked like the local neighborhood. Interesting. I hadn't heard that. Um, now, where's it going? Umumu has left the solar system. Where does it go next? You know, that is the one question I can't answer. I have been so focused on what is it and characterizing it and tracing back to where its home is that I have completely neglected to look at where it's going. It'd be interesting to see, you know, what, what would the future of Oumuamua be? Of course, if you wait long enough, we'll probably go out and get it. Um, if <laughs> in the far future, we'll, we'll head on out there when it's easy and cheap and finally lay to rest uh, the scientific mystery that it is. That was a bit of material that went over the edge. A bonus clip from a full episode of Event Horizon. New episodes every Thursday. So do be sure to hit subscribe. The full episode should be on your screen right about now. <laughs>